ahead and, and get started here. Thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, I'm going to uh, share my screen here really briefly. Okay, so uh, just want to welcome everybody. Um, in case you're not familiar with APA, we're a nonprofit uh, trade organization for photographers. Um, you know, uh, in DC, uh, you know, we particularly uh, try to celebrate our community and, um, you know, create, a, a, you know, a, a sense of community among our local photographers here. Um, but uh, we also offer business tools, um, yeah, inspiration, um, all sorts of events. Um, and uh, nationally, APA does a, a, a ton of um, advocacy work on behalf of photographers and copyright. So if, um, if you're not a member, please um, look into becoming a member. Um, we have some upcoming events I'd like to share. Uh, we're going to be announcing our um, LGBTQ IAP plus photography grant. Um, uh, this is something that DC started um, and uh, a national organization also uh, kicks in uh, money towards that. It's a $3,000 grant. Um, applications are going to open June 1st. We're going to be announcing more information about that uh, pretty soon. So please uh, keep an eye open for that. Then on June 15th, we're doing our monthly coffee break. This is just like a ca casual gathering at the National Portrait Gallery in the Kogod Courtyard. Um, it's uh, just a chance to kind of hang out. Um, you can feel free to come and talk about APA, talk about business, um, and just come and hang out for the day in DC. Um, and we've got our next 30 minutes uh, with event in June. That's June 25th. And that's with Connie Tsang, um, who's a, a hair and makeup artist here in DC. Um, she's going to be talking about, um, you know, how uh, hair and makeup artists can uh, help improve your uh, photo shoots, become a, a part of your team, um, and essentially how you can use them beyond the the standard ways that you would think that you would obviously be using a hair and makeup artist um, in your productions. Um, Back to uh, membership. Um, if you are a member or you think about becoming a member, uh, please make sure that you are utilizing um, your member benefits and discounts. Um, if you're not a member, um, you know, for sure you could be, uh, you know, saving yourself some money with uh, any of these uh, sponsors that uh, APA has. So please take a look. And um, if you are doing stuff, uh, if you're a member and you're utilizing any of these, make sure you're taking advantage of your member discounts. Um, not a member. Please use our uh, discount code DC1 for 20. That'll give you $20 off of any membership level. Um, okay. All right. And uh, so with that, I'm going to turn things over to Farah Skyke, who's uh, the, today's speaker. And um, I'm going to allow her to, to introduce herself and, uh, and take it away from here. Okay. Uh, oh, and I just want to mention too, we'll take questions at the end of the event. Okay. Thank you. Every Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much for that introduction. Hi, everyone. My name is Farah Skyke. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I am a music, drag, movement, food photographer uh, here in the DC area. And um, I appreciate you all taking some time to uh, out of your day to listen to me talk about what I do. Uh, I appreciate it quite a bit. So I'm going to get my screen share going here. Please excuse my quirkiness. And here we are. So just want to start off with a couple of reclamations, affirmations that have really guided my work throughout the years, um, things that maybe I wish I found sooner as I was exploring uh, this part of my creative practice. Um, these are from a writing and creative writing practitioner called Jocelyn Buchanan. I really like her work. If you're ever interested in expanding your creative purview beyond just photography, uh, she is a fantastic resource. Uh, but the first one is that there are stories I carry that are worthy of being shared. Um, good thing to remind yourself of when you're going and there is a lot happening in the market in the various markets. Uh, the second of which being when I feel like I've lost or let, lost or like I've forgotten my purpose, my community is there to remind me of who I am and where I'm heading. Um, a lot of my work is really community centric, whether it is uh, my punk scene, in my city, that I have been a part of since I moved here, um, or if it is my friends and peers in the Arab American community showing up for each other and showing up in form of protest right now, um, whatever it is, I try to have community guide most of what I am doing uh, in my life, in my career. I'm going to start off in 2016. Um, the name of this uh, photo 
is abbreviated for I Don't Know You Shit, which is the name of a song by a band called Pure Disgust. Uh, that was a big part of a new wave of hardcore punk in DC. Uh, this photo is really special to me and I'm starting with it because it features people I know, people I hold dear, um, people who have grown up quite a lot since then. This photo is eight years old. Uh, so you've got my roommate Lauren in the back middle. We've got a friend Kayla. We've got Leo who sings in a bunch of bands. We've got this one guy kind of front and center that I, I do not know this guy's name, but he's having the time of his life. And um, the, th the reason I wanted to share this photo to start things off is the photo's energy. Um, I have always been drawn to photos that even if we're looking at something static, has a lot of movement, has a lot of energy, has a lot of excitement. Um, and those are the photos that drew me to photographing punk. Those are the photos that drew me to photographing movement. Um, I don't necessarily care if the photo is perfect as far as composition, as far as uh, technical skill. Um, I need to feel something when I see an image like this. And um, the I need the people who I'm sharing this with to feel something when they see an image like this. Uh, so this kind of started an era of my own photography. Uh, even though I started photographing music kind of formally in I would say 2010, uh, this was around the time where I started turning my lens towards the crowd. Uh, I really firmly believe that the crowd is equally as responsible for the energy in the room as the band. If the band is giving their all and giving killer performance and the crowd just kind of, you know, we have a bad reputation in DC for having a uh, crossed arms and nodding crowd at concerts, unfortunately. Uh, but when you're doing that, um, the night's not going to feel the same. The excitement is not going to be the same. Um, I think we all contribute to the energy in a room, in a space. So this is how I wanted to kind of start off and set the tone. Um, oops. Um, this is a photo of my friend Marissa. She seems to see sings in a band um, that unfortunately doesn't exist anymore called Screaming Females. Uh, this band was all running for almost 18 years out of uh, Philadelphia before they called it quits earlier this year. Uh, but they are a band that has been part of my photography journey almost the entire time. Uh, the first band I shot with a press pass in 2010. They were the opening band um, and my photography has grown a lot since that point um, so it's been interesting to photograph them year after year after year since 2010 uh, and see how they have grown as far as musicians what kind of journey they're on um, what their interactions look like each, with each other how they are interacting with each other on stage how they're interacting with spaces with the crowd and juxtapose that with how my photography has grown um, at the same time and this is kind of a this photo, the photo that was on the graphic, kind of merged between two, merged these two that merges these two ideas together. Sorry, um, where we are seeing a lot of focus on the performer, but we're also getting in that crowd action. Um, and I think a lot of people will look at photos like this, and the first question I'll get is like, how do I get a photo like that? How do I get where were you in the room? Where did this happen? Um, and the question a lot of people have about this is access. Uh, now this was at a big music festival, and a lot of punk festivals, punk shows. Um, it's normal to see photographers standing on the side of the stage or standing on the back of the stage. Uh, but a lot of those photographers are people who are either working with the venue, um, the band, the booker who put on the show, the festival, the promoter, something like that. So this isn't just something that happens that you magically get put on stage one night, maybe at the very beginning of your, of your you know, photo journey. I'm not going to say career because my career isn't really in photographing punk, but um, this isn't something that just kind of magically happens the first time you're shooting a show. Um, it could, if you're really, really lucky. Uh, it, it also, some punk spaces are just very small and there's no other place to stand. I have been, you know, in a corner next to a dehumidifier behind a guitarist taking photos at a show because the room was tiny and there was no room. Um, but this photo at Damage City Fest in 2018 is one of my favorites. Uh, this is a punk festival that celebrates, uh, not just like celebrates DC, punk, punk music as a whole. Um, it's a kind of place where you could see bands uh, that played a little bit more of like a punk rock style, more hardcore punk, more metal influence, more poppy influence. Uh, it was really a great so showcase of the city um, and bands beyond that. I think there are bands from like Spain and Japan and Mexico and Ireland and all over the world that came to play at this festival. Uh, but this is kind of a melding of, uh, you know, still following the artist, still keeping the art artist as a central figure in the photo. In this case also, not just central, oops, um, but off to the side as well. Um, but how important the crowd's energy is in a in a room like this. Um, the singer is not going to jump into a situation like this. If the crowd is not excited about it, they're going to stay on the stage. Um, so all of this led up to me 
whoops, releasing a photo book uh, in 2020, leap day 2020, right before everything closed down. Um, I had been photographing hardcore punk in DC pretty consistently since about 2015. And I was really tired of getting in Ubers or cars in other cities. And when I told people where I was from or what I did, saying things like, oh, there used to be a great punk scene here. Um, or even people who live in the area now saying, oh, yeah, I used to see all these bands. We used to have this thing. And I got really sick of that because my life, when I wasn't working a day job, was being at these shows, photographing them, having bands stay over at my me and my friend's house who were touring and needed a floor or a couch to crash on, uh, supporting kind of the scene of the community in any way that we could and thinking, this scene is happening right now. The, the bands that exist in this city, that are coming to the city are really dynamic, really vibrant. There's a lot happening here. Um, there's lots of different kinds of punk and DIY music happening in the city and I don't think it ever stopped. And I was really frustrated with people talking about this thing, this scene as a past tense thing. So I put out this book called Present Tense um, that surely came out of frustration and the mentality of I told you so. <laughs> that was really what drove it. Um, pettiness will go a long way if you direct it to the right things. <laughs> so one of my favorite things about the, the image that I chose for the cover of this book um, are the two figures in Hit Kohai and um, Chivero are two DC transplants that were both in DC for a short amount of time. Um, one of which was um, Kohei came to study art from the Corcoran. Uh, uh, Chivero came to DC from Brazil after meeting DC bands that were touring in Brazil. And while these people were both just temporarily part of DC, uh, they left a really big impact. And uh, from, you know, going back to kind of how my relationship with photographing music, photographing punk has changed. Again, starting a relationship photographing a band starting in 2010 at the Black Cat led to making photos for album promotion for a band like this as well. Um, so again, we I, I went from, you know, hard flash at shows and not really knowing how to shoot any other way to giving myself the opportunity and the challenge to learn how to use different spaces, scout locations, not just using what was being provided to me. And at the same time, this band was rising and rising and at a different place where they weren't just, you know, settling for taking the band photo against the brick wall behind the venue, which is a classic for a reason. It is very convenient, but we were both in an opportunity to do something different. All right. And back to one of the last times I photographed this band, this band became such a big pillar of their own community in Philly, in New Jersey, uh, that they ended up starting their own festival that had no corporate sponsorships. Uh, no paid PR, no anything like that. And you can kind of see the excitement of the folks in the room. Um, you can see kind of the trust. Marissa is like, according to many magazines, one of the greatest guitarists of all time. So for her to do something like that's kind of a big deal. If you have not listened to this band, I highly encourage you to do it. Um, but uh, again, just having that kind of benchmark, this is like 11 years of photographing a band and seeing how much the both journeys had changed is a is a or both journeys where both journeys have taken us uh, is really helpful for me to have that benchmark of where I'm at in my career and how much I've grown as well. Now I don't just photograph punk shows. I like photographing all kinds of concerts. I love pop music. It is not a guilty pleasure. I don't feel guilty about it at all, um, not one bit. And uh, I have had the opportunity over my music photography career to photograph at bigger venues in DC. Um, this one, this Thundercat photo, unfortunately labeled incorrectly. These are both shows I shot at the Anthem in 2023. Um, and while I love the opportunity to have a big roomy photo pit, uh, lots of barricade access and not getting kicked in the head by anybody and not getting my lip busted on my own camera, which has happened before. Um, it's definitely a different experience photographing at these bigger venues where you have this kind of, you have a photo pass, three songs, no flash kind of policy. Um, but at the same time, while I love capturing these kind of tighter shots, cleaner shots of folks in their element doing their thing, my favorite photos are always going to be the ones that give you that crowd perspective or that glimpse into the feeling of the evening. So these, this is the same Janelle Monáe concert, but it's shot at a little bit of a lower point. Um, you're getting into it. You can see more of the band. You can see the dancer. The vibe of this night was very much grown and sexy. So while it was great to have her in her, you know, previous Midsommar outfit, having a lot of personality, this was also the personality of the night. There was definitely that like groovy, funky, adult, sexy vibe in that room. So capturing that 
giving somebody a glimpse of what it felt like to be in that room, even if they didn't get a ticket or couldn't make it to the show, is my priority when it comes to that. Standing with this uh, photo of Thundercat, you know, the previous photo shows his personality quite a bit, but this is really what it felt like to kind of stumble into the moment, if you will. Um, this set that he was playing on was really like larger than life. It's literally a giant Thundercat. He walked out of that uh, opening right there to start the set off. Um, it was just him and two musicians. And um, the the size of the sound was really impactful. The size of the set was really impactful. So again, anytime I can, you know, this photo is great. You can see him in his element. You can see his personality. He's got anime pins on his knit hat uh, and is wearing like, you know, anime inspired clothing and all this kind of stuff. Uh, but this gives you a sense of what the night felt like, what the night looked like, and really the scope of this event. Um, and I will say there's something to be said for following your gut, um, honoring your uh, style, leaning into your own personal style that you've created. Uh, because in 2021, I was contacted by a photo editor at Rolling Stone and they were working on a feature, feature featuring underrated music cities in the country. Um, so this was the opening for the DC spread or for the spread as a whole, uh, really. And it is Go Go Band Rare Essence performing at Aqua Club. Um, and they wanted me to photograph the band in this way that was, you know, upfront, in your face, crowd perspective, um, bright, high contrast, and, and uh, palpable energy, right? I have seen lots of photos of this band where everybody is looking pretty and beautiful and retouched and all that kind of thing. And I have also seen, you know, camcorder footage of them and Polaroids of them. Uh, but having the opportunity to photograph them in the st a style that feels true to me was a huge honor for me. Um, I was very happy to be able to do that and have a publication recognize that style that I have put years of work into cultivating and say we want to bring your style into this. Um, and I'm going to be transitioning from the music part of this conversation to a different one, but uh, one of the most impactful things about photographing this scene and being part of it for me is that uh, I've made the mistake in this conversation so far of using the word scene and community interchangeably, and they're not the same thing. Uh, a scene is, you know, exactly what you think it is. It is, you know, a vibe. A bunch of people are kind of doing this thing. Community is, is, is an action word. Community is looking out for each other. Community is creating something together, is cultivating. So in this community, uh, this is one of the last photos I shot of a band called Homo Superior. It's one of the last photos I shot of this band Homo Superior because the next time they played, I was the new guitarist. So this literally became part of my life to the point that I was, I didn't think I was in playing bands anymore post high school. And here I was playing in this band um, and playing in this band up until COVID shut everything down again. Um, but it's really taken me to a lot of different places. And sometimes those places are like DC9 and Comet Ping Pong. And it's not the most exciting thing in the world if you're just looking at it uh, you know, from this side of things, but it, it has been really excited to, uh, exciting to be on the other side of the stage, however uh, low to the ground or small the stage might be. And through that connection, uh, performing in a band with a drag performer, uh, that took me to also photographing more drag and nightlife in the DC community and um, still, using you know the hard flash I love to use, still the high contrast, still bright, but introducing color. Uh, because as this performer told me, I did not match my wig to my boots, to my beard, all pink, so that you could shoot this photo in black and white. So we have switched to a little more color these days to honor the work that these performers have put into their craft. <laughs> so another big part of my photography practice is food. And this is something I started taking more seriously around 2012. Um, Dolce Gelato, which is a local business, was one of my first big clients. This is where I started implementing more creative direction. I was running social media, creative cohesive events, started to do some PR and wearing my, you know, um, publicist hat when thinking about what photos were needed for an event, wearing my social media manager hat when thinking about what photos were needed for a post or an announcement. Um, and I was still kind of finding my style. I was still going for very safe, kind of neutral, natural photos. Um, which there is nothing wrong with. That is not me talking, talking smack about anybody's style. Uh, but it was very safe and it was very, you know, I had this idea that my personal practice with these, this poppy in your face textured style was for my punk photos and my music photos, but maybe not for food photos. I think this was right around the era of like chef's table becoming a thing and really serious food photos and really like classic traditional food photos. Um, and I was still a little bit timid. And, and um, I wish I hadn't been because I was working with really, really fantastic chefs and 
bartenders and creative folks in general in the industry and playing it relatively safe. Now, I'm not trying to talk smack about myself either. These photos definitely capture, you know, the atmosphere. They definitely tell a story that's still really important. It's still true to what the food is, right? I'm not, I'm really not a food porn person. Like the cheese pulls and the exaggerated syrup and stacks is not really for me. That is more, you know, of course, this is still commercial work, but um, I was going more for telling a story of what it felt like to be in the moment and less than trying to sell an, an, an experience that may or may not be attainable to the person looking at the thing on the screen. Um, and I also had some time at the Line Hotel in DC as part of the creative team. And this is where I started stepping out a little bit more and getting a little bit more whimsical. As you can see, we're in a little bit more whimsical of a setting. We had the original church organs of the building repurposed to be the chandelier in the background. I started zooming out a little bit more. I started trying to tell a bigger story than just a dish or a chef on its own at this part of my life. Um, and then fast forward to a completely different champagne fountain. Uh, this is work that I created for Resi, the reservation platform when they were working with the diplomat. Um, Resi was a really exciting brand to find. Uh, they, the creative producers for this found me mostly because they knew I shot food, but they were saying to me, you shoot these nightlife events like drag and punk with this bright poppy in your face, almost like paparazzi catching you on the best night of your life kind of vibe. We like that, but we want you to bring it to the food. And it was one of the first times a uh, brand had said to me out loud, we want you to do your thing with our thing. Um, and it was really validating. It was really validating to, I had wanted to make this connection for a while, uh, but for whatever reason I hadn't, maybe I was feeling timid. Maybe I had told myself this idea that uh, this just didn't fit, but it was really exciting to be able to uh, be able to bring this over here, uh, bring this style over to something else I really love, which is food. And um, I do love these because like, this was a fun party. This was a two day event with like, you know, branded items and a champagne tower and free gelato being given out um and everybody who was in the room was like, are you taking pictures take my picture i look great tonight you know this this whoever's uncle this is in the photo uh said that to me which is not always the case for diners but uh you know i felt very invited into the space and people were definitely feeling the spirit of the event so we went with it and around covid really not just in 2023 but around covid breaking out of quarantine mode figuring out what I wanted to focus on. I wasn't doing social media anymore. I wasn't doing PR anymore. I didn't want to do any of those things anymore. I just wanted to focus on photo. Um, I kept finding my way to people who wanted to do brighter, punchier photo. I kept finding my, my way to people who cared more about setting a tone, about creating, um, about, about, about conveying emotion uh, than they did having a technically perfect photo. So one of those opportunities was to work with pastry chef Paula Velez. You might know her from the Bakers Against Racism campaign. She has a cookbook coming out, but we were able to work together on uh, still images for a food and wine series called Pastries Paula that is a like YouTube style cooking show with various desserts. And even the shots that we made with natural light, uh, you know, they really wanted me to lean into my the direct light where I still had that high texture a little bit gritty in the moment, perfect, but not too perfect, high contrast shadows. I love a good shadow. And I got all of that, like shooting this in direct light outside on like the patio um, outside of the house that we used for this shoot. So even when I wasn't using my lighting setup, I was looking for opportunities to kind of mimic that and bring that same look and feel even with natural light um, whenever we could. Um, another exciting opportunity I had, uh, not post COVID, cause we're still in COVID. But post lockdown mode uh, was working with Roya Shariat and her mom Gita Sade on the project Maman and Me. Um, we were connected through a friend uh, on Twitter and Roya wanted to gift her mom who was becoming kind of a TikTok celebrity for things like this, flipping the tadig rice perfectly out of the pot every time. And for her Iranian home cooking, uh, she was kind of becoming a TikTok star uh, while they were just making videos of mom cooking while they were quarantining at home. And she said, I want to give my mom a shoot for her birthday and, you know, help make her feel like, you know, Ina Garten. I was like, great, sounds good. We love Iranian Ina Garten. We did the shoots in their home. It was great. Um, and that led to me working on the cookbook that they put out in 2022, I think, 2022, 2023. Time does not make sense anymore. Uh, but that led to the creation of this cookbook. And we shot the whole cookbook in their home um, using uh, the lighting setup that I had been using for a while, punchy or bright, or just using direct sunlight, like this photo of the rice on the right, uh, whenever we could. 
to um, really get into the textures of the food, really get into the deeper story. For example, this is a dish called tachin. It's kind of a baked rice casserole and we needed to kind of break it open to show people what was inside. You know, this is kind of like a, not a lasagna because it's really got three layers, but it's like rice, stuffing rice. So if we just shot a picture of it without opening it up or without the decor, it really wouldn't have told any kind of story other than there's a rice dish, good stuff is inside, but you got to use your imagination. Um, and we really wanted to create um, a cookbook that really hadn't been done for Iranian food. That was a little bit more accessible. That got away from the more traditional taking ourselves very seriously style of photography that was in a lot of those books, all respect to those books. That is how I started learning about Iranian cooking. Um, but we wanted the opportunity to do something different because this is a different story. This was a home cook who got popular on TikTok uh, with people saying, if my rice looked like that, my mom would kill me. Or like, we have rice that's crispy like that in our country too. So different story required different storytelling means. And this is how we ended up here. And I've been really excited that in the past few years, I found clients who have really have also been excited about uh, leaning into that aesthetic of punchy, bright, high flash. Uh, these are some photos we made for El Presidente. They wanted a little bit more out of the box, not just food on a plate on the table. Uh, for example, we got this image on the left that felt a little bit more like editorial fashion photo of the popsicle. It was really cloudy and gross outside. It was not a good day to hold up a popsicle towards the sky, um, but we saw that it kind of complemented the colors of the couch and just went for it. Uh, the photo on the right, I don't know if my Zoom chat is covering it or not, uh, but this photo on the right of the cocktail, if you've been to El Presidente, it's right next to Union Market, they have a big mural kind of diorama over the bar. Um, I hate heights, but I got on that ladder and I put that cocktail there and said my thoughts and prayers and tried my best. And that is what we ended up um, with in the diorama in the middle of the, uh, with the cocktail in the middle. I keep clicking on the wrong thing. And further than um, neighboring El Presidente is La Cosecha. So being able to find a middle ground between my very high punchy, high, uh, punchy, high contrast, lots of heavy shadow style uh, and brought that with the team at La Cosecha for their most recent promotional campaign um, for their variety of, of, uh, of vendors as well. Um, to take a little bit of a turn, as you can see, I like to do a little bit of everything. I photograph drag, I photograph music, I photograph uh, uh, food, I photograph my dog when he's cute, um, a little bit of everything. And um, when my mind is running through all these different ideas that I've got and I can't really stick to one thing, uh, the best thing I've done for myself is slow down. So just listen to some things I like to do to slow down or get that moment of rest or get inspired. Um, so I'll just run through those real quick. Um, taking creative classes or mediums on or taking creative classes or workshops unrelated to my medium. Um, I like taking classes at places like Reloom, whether that's like binding a book or painting a candle or whatever it may be, doing something that has nothing to do with photography uh, helps me come back to my photography with fresh eyes and new ideas. Reading fiction or poetry does this as well. There's a lot of serious shit going on in the world. I, it's very important to read about it. Um, but reading fiction and poetry helps me. Um, connect to the ideas that I feel like are somewhere in my brain, but I'm just having a little trouble accessing them. Um, same thing with the Creative Independent. Uh, if you don't subscribe to Creative Independent, it's an Instagram page and a website, but they also have a daily newsletter. And on the weekdays around 7 a.m. Eastern time, you get a uh, email with an interview of a different creative person. So it could be a photographer, musician, chef, uh, poet, sculptor, what have you, um, and reading about their process and their inspirations. Um, cooking with an ingredient I haven't cooked with before, that's always a fun challenge for me, especially when photographing food. It's easy when you're photographing food to learn things from food stylists on set and chefs here and there. You learn different tips and tricks that they can offer, ha they have to offer to you. Um, but nothing really beats trying stuff out for yourself to understand how that chef or that company making that product may interact with that ingredient it gives you a bigger story. Um, this is a new one for me, Long Walk, set to Andre 3000's flute album. I am an Outcast fan. I was really hoping for an Andre 3000 album for with rap on it. This was not a rap album. This was a beautiful flute album. And I probably listened to this album on longer walks of 30 minutes or more, maybe like twice a week. Uh, it's been very restorative to not be scrolling, not listen to talking, not listen to lyrics and just instrumental music in general. Uh, and the last thing that has been one for me for a while, if I'm in a rut, if I'm feeling stuck, I have the uh, Photographer's Playbook, which is a little book from, I think Aperture put it out, but it is just a, over 300 assignments that you can choose from, give yourself 
uh, I'll flip to a random page and give myself an assignment and try to do something different. And it's time to pick up the camera, but get the juices flowing. Thank you for coming to my APA talk. Awesome. Fantastic. Th thank you, Farah. That's uh, really, really, really appreciate you uh, pre presenting and showing us everything and absolutely love how um, your aesthetic has uh, all come together to uh, to make the images that you're making now. Um, wanted to go ahead and open it up for uh, for questions. Um, if, uh, if anybody wants to feel free to uh, unmute yourself or um, raise your hand. Okay, we do actually have a question in the in the chat here from Rob. Um, let's see here. Um, it says I love so much of your work, Farah. The black and white music work is gorgeous. Um, are those shot on film, uh, black and white prints? Um, some of them were shot on film. A lot of them were digital. I um, I'm definitely inspired by a lot of film photographers, uh, but um, fortunately slash unfortunately. Uh, turnaround times are turnaround times, and when a publication or a band is asking for photos the next day, but they want a film look and feel, there is not always time to give them a film look and feel the next morning at 9 a.m. after they have finished their set. So as much as I'd like to shoot more shows and film, um, for now, we are mimicking. I know that's kind of taboo. I am sorry. But whenever I can, I like to do it. I have a lot of fun doing it. Um, but unfortunately, that is, I think, part of the rush of the digital social media age of it all. Excellent. Um, yeah, that certainly makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, I always wonder how how photographers who are shooting film these days are meeting deadlines uh, <laughs> for for certain things as much as we all want to return to to shooting film. Um, yeah. Right. Uh, Steve has a, a question. Um, Steve, if you want to unmute yourself, um, if if you let's see if you're yep. not. Yeah. Sorry about that. Right ahead, Steve. Hi, Farah. Thanks for uh, sharing your work and. Uh, sharing this time with us. I'm here in California in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, you mentioned, um, you know, you've been taking time to like figure out how to rest and recuperate, you know, work is super stressful. And then how do we unplug and, and check? And I noticed that you mentioned you photograph protests sometimes, and there's a lot of turmoil happening in the world. Um, you identify as an Arab photographer. I'm curious what, how you've been handling the stress of what's happening globally in your work as a photographer and managing to still continue to do the things that you need to do regard when you're seeing trauma happening in a global sense and in our states, DC, I mean, all of our cities are going through massive upheaval of, of civil unrest. And um, yeah, I'd be curious, no pressure if you don't wanna answer this. I didn't, I just kind of curveballed you, but I, I it's something no, I think about every day. There's no pressure at all. I think about it a lot as well. Yes, I'm. my family is Lebanese. My family is from the South of Lebanon. So this has been a really difficult time for my family. Uh, nothing is more stressful than waking up to check WhatsApp to see if everybody is okay. So it's been a very long few months. Um, I took a lot of time away from photographing concerts. I spend less time on social media. I try to find um, less jarring ways to receive the information I need to receive. Unfortunately, having spent a lot of time in South Lebanon with my family, I have been present during wars. I have wartime PTSD. So viewing really jarring and graphic images a lot is not good for me. I'm not great service to myself or to anybody else in my community, including like Palestinian friends, um, if I am not taking care of myself as well. So a lot of the time that is finding um, other news sources, Democracy Now!, things like that, talking to family directly and trying to keep uh, the graphic images uh, to a minimum for myself. I understand why the impact is important to move people, uh, but I don't always need to be the one to consume it as a person with that kind of PTSD. Um, long walks, lots of time with my dog. I'm not sure if I saw a dog sitting next to you um, at some point during your, your chat, but um, my, my, my guy Bruno's on the other side of this door wondering um, why nobody ever pays attention to him. But, um, and spending a lot of time with that family. Um, I have started working on my next personal project, which I won't give too much away about, which has a lot to do with grief and has a lot to do with family. So spending more time with my family, it's very easy to self-isolate during a difficult time. It's very easy to feel pressure to keep producing during a difficult time. Um, you know, it's easy to go on social media and see other photographers making work that I wish I was making right now. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm full of a lot of anxiety about 
how family is doing or how my friends' families are doing or are, are my friends safe going to GW or whatever is happening, you know? Um, so uh, leaning into that and honoring my anxiety and my grief and finding ways to connect that through my art uh, has been really important and really impactful for me during this time. And hopefully in the next few months, I'll be able to share more about this project. But thank you for your question. I appreciate it. I intentionally included things about rest and uh, mental health because it's really easy to brush those under a rug or consider them not professional enough to be discussed in a forum like this, which it's part of our lives. We're still human, mm -hmm. even if we're professionals. So mm -hmm. thank you so much. Thank you, Farah. Thank you for that question, Steve. Um, and uh, for, I don't know if you want to stop sharing your screen for a moment oh, sure. so we, we can go You don't back want to look at the chicken? The I don't know. Oh, yeah. well. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, uh, let's see. And I, you know, I do know that you just brought up, um, you know, that you're working on a, a personal project that you don't necessarily want to go into detail about right now. But I do have a question about um, uh, how are you uh figuring out like what kind of personal projects or other projects that you want to take on and and um what sort of goals do you have with those um in terms of getting work or is uh, for you know just a personal um expanding your uh your style or, or anything like that can you talk about yeah. that a little bit i mean i'm a deeply curious person i also joke that i'm very indecisive um, it is Gemini season. I'm in my season as a dis indecisive person who is interested in too many things at the same time. Could also be the ADHD. I don't know. But um, I think the art of navigating that season is, you know, the Gemini is the two sides or the two faces and finding the line right down the middle instead of going from one extreme to the other. So for me, I've been trying to be more balanced in my approach. I've been trying to be more balanced in how much work I take on. Um, for years, I have said yes to everything. And it has helped me create the portfolio I have today, but it's not always great for your mental or physical health. So slowing down a little bit, being more intentional with what I take. Um, and right now, um, I am thankfully in the privileged position to say yes to work that I feel is values aligned with me, uh, where I feel like I can be of unique use to help tell a story that maybe my other peers are not coming out from the same perspective. Uh, as far as personal work, um, I'm probably making the most vulnerable and personal work I've ever done. You know, photographing the punk community, that's a community I'm part of. It is personal to me, but not to this level. Not so much about staring, telling stories about myself, um, my family, other creative humans in the DC area who are part of the Arab diaspora, um, my trans community in the drag world. Um, incorporating and um, those folks and their stories is kind of an emotional heavy lift. So I'm really working on taking time and pushing back against the um, urgency that social media has created around cranking out work. Um, it's such like a double-edged sword because it is how I have gotten my name out there over the years. It is how bands find me and will ask to if I can come photograph their show. It is how restaurants will find me or chefs will find me and say, hey, I'm opening up a restaurant, we need photos and it's great. But um, renegotiating my relationship, and how I use that tool and make sure that I am using it as a tool and it is not influencing how I do work, how often I do work, how quickly I do work, how quickly I post work. Um, it's really just moving with more intention and more ease. Uh, but I always love June, a lot of great pride events um, going on that are values aligned with me. Um, I tend to go for more of the community events rather than the bigger corporate ones. So I'm really looking forward to that. And um, uh, balancing it out with play, you know, I thinking, contemplating more about conversations I have, maybe a conversation I have with a friend um, who tells me about something that's going on with them and saying like, hey, I really want to learn more about that. And maybe seeing if there is a way that the way I'm perceiving their story and the way they're perceiving their experience can come together in art um, and not forcing things that don't fit. I think that's a big one. I think it's very easy to really, really, really want something to work out and really, really want something to be your thing. But if you're not listening to your gut and trusting your gut that's telling you, I don't think this is it, then uh, you're doing yourself a disservice and potentially a client a disservice as well. Yeah. Great answer. I um I do have a question. Um, I'm curious about, um, you know, I mean, you, you going back to the music photography, I know you mentioned, um, you know, like that you do have these relationships with some of the local bands and, um, you know, and I, I presume that allows you to have conversations with them about um, how you're going to approach uh, photographing them um, and in terms of getting access um, to certain things. Um, I'm curious, uh, 
when you don't have that opportunity or not familiar with the band or say it's a, a venue that has certain rules where they say, well, you can only mm -hmm. photograph the first two songs or something. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about how you approach that kind of a situation? Um, or, and are, are you ever able to advocate for, for more access um, or um, do you have a, a certain way that you say, okay, this is what I need to do to make sure that I'm going to get the photos that I need in the limited time I have? Sure. So um, I navigate a line between making photos that are art and artistic and documenting the night. And I never want my documenting to get in the way of the band doing their thing or the folks in the crowd enjoying themselves. Uh, that is the line that I draw for myself and and a line most, most bands would like to have drawn. Um, it also kind of depends on what venue you're shooting at. If you're shooting at a venue like a, um, you know, like some of these smaller venues that I had in the photos, as far as like the pinch, you know, that's a basement venue at a bar. There, there weren't really rules. The rule was like, don't be an asshole. <laughs> that's kind of it. Like, don't be a jerk. It's not about you. And that applies to like anybody who is not the people on stage, including me. So if a, if a band has asked me to come, if I have come to shoot a show, um, you know, when I feel like I have the shots, I might step back, put the camera down and enjoy myself. I think I really try to photograph stuff that I like. I think it shows that I like what I'm photographing. It shows, I think you can tell in my photos that I am, I am part of that energy that I'm showing you in the image. Um, and of course, sometimes there's assignments. But um, when you're photographing at a more informal venue and there are fewer rules, I kind of just ask the band, like, hey, do you guys care if I use flash? Especially if I don't know them. Maybe there's an out-of-town band on the bill. If you don't, do you guys care? Is that going to bother anybody? And if they're like, oh, we're cool with it, go for it. Or, yeah, but maybe not, like, all night, you know? Then maybe I'll limit it. I'll, 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 I'll think about that. Because as a person who, in, in 2017, started playing in a band and then had the flash turned on me, I'm like, wow, that is bright. Is that how it feels for these folks when I do this to them? So <laughs> kind of got a taste of my own medicine for a few years there. Um, but um, it's just, it's being respectful. It's not being a jerk because you want to cultivate that relationship. It's kind of hard to be like, oh, well, they don't want flash, but I'm just going to do it anyway because I want my photos. You know, there's, there's, there's multiple shows a week. You'll have an opportunity if you don't get the opportunity tonight. Um, no one opportunity is going to be the end all be all of everything. Uh, but as far as photographing at more formal formal venues, unless you have an all access pass through the venue, what I mean by more formal venues is like your 9:30 clubs, anthems, Mary Weathers, Baltimore Soundstage, stuff like that. Um, the, whatever the policy is for the photographers is the policy for the photographers. And unless you have that all access pass through the band for whatever reason, whether you're part of the touring production team, um, whether you know you are me and you are friends with them and you're going to photograph their set and they give you all access so you can get side stage and backstage and, and in the photo pit or on the balcony. Um, the rules are kind of the rules. You're not going to appeal to anybody working on that night who's just like, oh yeah, your photos are cool. I'll let you have some longer time. Like there is a reason those rules exist. At bigger venues, that first three in front of the barricade rule exists because at the end of the set, uh, people might look a little bit crazy. They might look a little bit sweaty. They might... Uh, they might not look the, as good as they looked at the beginning of their set before they started moving around and, and sweating really hard under bright lights and lots of cell phone cameras. So, um, you know, it's in, in those cases, the rules are kind of set, but um, it really is just about showing up. Like my biggest advice to folks who want to make it big or make music photography a bigger part of their career is like, start with the local shows. You don't know who is going to, you know, kind of become the next big band and the next big thing. And, um, you know, if you build a good rapport that is respectful, if you find somebody who is aligned with how you like to shoot, what you like to bring to the room, what you like to bring to the vision, um, you could cultivate a really great relationship and, and that could that could continue to grow for both of you. Great advice, great advice. Um, and I uh, had one more question for you for myself. Um, and it's not something you really went into, but you, I know you have very multifaceted uh, a career in life. And I, I know you also do like framing, um, art framing stuff. Um, can you talk about, has that um, informed uh, the way you approach photography in any ways? Can you discuss that a little bit? Yeah, a bit. Um, I started apprenticing uh, from my friend Meredith, she runs um, Frame Avenue Design, which is a studio out of Kensington, but she's mobile, so she will come to you, pick up, lay out a gallery wall, install, all that good stuff. Um, but she has framed my work for me in the past for shows, and I was dropping off prints that somebody had bought from me uh, to her because she was framing a, a gallery wall for them of like concert photos and posters and ticket stubs and stuff like that. And she was like, you want to learn how to do this and get paid? And I was like, it is January 2021. I am not working as much as I used to. Yes, I would like to learn how to do this and get paid. Um, 
which was great. But honestly, it's very meditative for me. I will put on like an album or a playlist or a podcast and get going. Um, but it has helped me think about composition on my feet more because sometimes when I'm shooting, I can think about how this would look framed, how this would look matted, how this would look on a wall, what dimensions might make sense. I and mean, I'm not thinking about dimensions while I'm shooting, but um, I am keeping more of that in mind. And we get a lot of art across the desk. Sometimes uh, some of the stuff we're framing is like somebody's kids life touch photos from K through 12 and that's the wall and that's great and that's fine. It is so fun watching those kids grow up. Sometimes we get like vintage photos from the 70s and 80s or wedding photos or things like that, diplomas, what have you. But a lot of the time we get really great art and it has really helped me come across different artists and consider um, different approaches or makes me want to try something new or introduce a new component or just, or just experiment with a new style uh, in my work or even like getting a really nice photo print being like, oh, what is this paper they use? This is nice. I want to look into this, you know, or, or something like that or um, there's a lot to appreciate with that job. So it's helping me become better at my composition on my feet because I'm thinking about those things and I'm framing my art more often. I'm a big proponent in this digital age of uh, being great, something physical with your art, then you should. Um, it will help you and others appreciate and respect it even more. Uh, but yeah, it's just helped me. Uh, it's even it's put an even higher value on the tangible for me. Uh, and currently working on like, framing a gallery wall for stuff in our apartment. Um, and not just having nice photos sitting in a pile somewhere um, working on it. Excellent. Oh, very cool. Um, right. Well, I, I don't, do, do we have any um, any more audience questions uh, for Farah before we let everyone go? Um, you can unmute yourself or raise your hand. OK. Um. Yes, sorry. Oh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Hey, Mike. Hey, Mike. How you doing? Good, good afternoon. Um, I had a question about um to uh sarah um about uh kind of like your instinct of your mindset when you tackle like a concert event photography like what's like a few tips and advice you give to someone like in the thinking mode and um just just kind of like a thinking like advice like just a few pinpoints to kind of keep a heads up for and um how do you, that, that's like one part of the question. And then the second part of the question that I have, so two questions is, how do you build confidence um, when you approach businesses uh, for rates and um, just your way of, um, yeah, building confidence when you talk to like businesses or people that reach out to you for work? Sure. Um, so the best advice I ever heard was from somebody who wrote a book about um, financial knowledge and financial literacy for women. Um, she was coming at it from a different angle, like a domestic angle of like usually financial information is passed from like men to their sons. And a lot of women don't know what's going on in the economics of a house. That might be different house to house. That was definitely my experience. Um, but somebody asked her a really similar question about just like salary negotiations. And the best advice I heard is find the highest number you can say without laughing and say it out loud. And that is the number that is your rate. Like if you can take yourself seriously when you say that number, that is the rate. The other thing, the other really great advice I got is if you had set a rate and everybody is saying yes really way too quickly for like a couple months on end, it might be time to increase that rate. Okay. Um, like if I'm like, oh, this is the day rate and somebody was like, cool, sounds good. And I realized that for three months I've been getting cool, sounds good and no pushback at all, then it, maybe it means I'm not charging enough. Um, and at the end of the day, like if you, ch if you're charging a little more per hour for a half day or a day, if somebody really wants to work with you and they can't meet the rate, they will tell you, we can't meet the rate. We can do this. Does that work? You might work in some negotiation or something, but most people are under, most people starting out undervaluing themselves severely. And what it creates is that the new person who's undervaluing the rates is making it harder for the existing folks to keep charging the rates that they're charging. Um, so don't undersell yourself, literally practice with a friend or, 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 a, or a sibling or whatever and just be like this is the rate and say it out loud and say it with a straight face um it it has been there are some challenges to um your first question so my confidence came in uh, or my lack of confidence when i started out came from being like oh i was barely 21 when i started shooting music i was often the youngest person in the photo pit at a big venue like a 9 30 club or a, or like a ram set or a sound stage um i uh was often one of the only women it is a really male dominated um, field of um, music photography. I am part of a collective. 
uh, called To the Front, which is a collective of women and non-binary visual artists in music uh, that has traveling shows around the country. And there are quite a lot of us who are part of the collective, and I'm sure even more that are not part of the collective. Um, but there is always this, like, there for a long time, especially the beginning of my career, there was always this questioning my intention or my credibility. So guys would be like, oh, did your boyfriend introduce you to this band? And really stupid questions like that, like, for a really long time. I remember once being like, I don't have a boyfriend. And that was not the flex that I thought it was. That just made me sound really silly. But, um, <laughs> you know, um, a lot of it was just, like, ignoring. Um, some of it, there's, there's, like, there's sexism everywhere. There's misogyny everywhere. There's racism everywhere. I think for me, it's like choosing your battles, kind of like, is it really worth arguing with the security guard? Is it really worth arguing with this like random person in the pit? Um, is it going to affect your mindset going into photographing this band set? If you do that, is it going to like, you know, you're going to be, you want to be shooting this set, this three songs you have in the front, thinking about the annoying thing that guy said to you, the annoying thing that person said to you. Um, and a lot of mindset is just like, especially events that are like not at formal music venues, just again, like documenting the show or documenting the event in a way that isn't getting in the way of anybody having a good time. Um, like it's not about you, you are there to help document what is happening when it's more of like an event than a concert. Um, communicating with the band, being polite, introducing yourself, like, um, you know, asking, you know, knowing who your uh, contact person is, uh, something like that. And then, um, Oh, shoot, what was I going to say? I had one more and it was really good. Um, but just being respectful and just having a good attitude. Like, you don't, you know, you do, or maybe you do, maybe you don't know the kind of day that the folks in the band are having or running the event or whatever. And my thing is, I always try to be the easiest person for anybody to deal with. Um, the last thing you want to be known for is like having, um, you know, like this being a problem. Uh, people, even if they love your photos, if they don't like working with you, they probably won't have you back. And so having a good attitude goes just as far as like creating great work. Um, and that's, and that's, that's what I got to, that's what I got to say. Hype yourself okay. up, listen to a hypo playlist. Mine is like Gucci Mane and Crime Mom. So that's what I listen to before I shoot stuff if I'm feeling yep. nervous. That's what I listen to before I played music and I would like take my glasses off and be like, I can't see the crowd. I'm fine. I'm Gucci Mane. I'm not Gucci Mane, but you know. <laughs> Um, but look, finding whatever it is that hypes you up and makes you feel confident and remembering that like you're in that room for a reason somebody wanted you there whether it's a publication that hired you the band somebody at the venue who believes in you whatever it is like somebody wants you there prove them right prove yourself right okay and the book that you created um uh where can i find this book to to purchase Sure. Um, it's on my website, farasgeike.com. It probably is on like the Eventbrite or on the APA page or things like that, but it's just my first name and last name. Um, I am going to slow down producing it after this summer. Um, so if you want to get one, now is a good time because I'm not sure when I'm going to print it again. Thank you for asking. Okay, no problem. And um, I also want to touch on some things that you said earlier about uh, a community kind of, you know, from other standpoints of people that you said yeah. feeling like, it, it's kind of like was in the past or a little bit forgotten um you know i i do feel like what you're saying like a hundred percent of like maybe like uh an art community was like maybe strong at one point and some people like from out of the city you know have seen it like kind of fade away so i feel you on that point but i would say that like i do appreciate you for you know still continuing to document as you said and capture like your interests of you know punk shows and just your interest in photography because i feel like at the end of the day um you know, as long as you're interested into it, um, it's always going to be living within like a community of people who yeah. are passionate and, you know, just love that genre of art. So, yeah, so I do feel it's nothing to really like worry too much about because I, I, you know, I've grown up, I've grown up in the D.C. area and I would say like I'm 24 now, but when I was 16, mm -hmm. um, there was like a one point where it was a, a heavy like art renaissance in D.C. and there was a lot of art shows and the art community was a really big and strong and it still is to today but I just feel like you know over time and with the pandemic shift it has altered it a little bit but yeah. I still feel you know there are individuals that are still keeping it um still to this day like you me and everyone in the chat that lives around the DC area so I feel you know as long as there's a community of people that's still striving for it like you know it's still there nothing's dead like I just yeah. I feel like you know in the past like it's kind of like how I think of film like people give that saying like 
film is not dead because like, you know, there's a community of people that are picking up film cameras and shooting film photos or shooting motion film like video and keeping that, you know, community of motion film alive within the digital world. So that's how I feel about like, you know, communities and cities that shift with like an art, you know, you know, fan base and like people being striving. And it's also a demographic of like, you know, DC being it like more of like the nation's capital. So some people have a second thought of like art in the city, but it's still there with the people like us. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So thank you. I do appreciate you covering on that because, um, you know, it's these are things that like I talk about to other friends and my siblings too as well. And we always tell each other that, you know, as long as, as you're passionate about it and you have other people around you, um, you can build and grow with that. So it, it doesn't feel like nothing is left behind. So, yeah. Yeah, I appreciate everything you're saying. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, Joseph, no problem. Hey, thank you for that. Thanks for the question. And and uh, I love your response, Farah. That's uh, <laughs> really wonderful. Um, it, yeah, uh, I know we're uh, coming up on an hour here. Um, I just want to thank everybody for, for joining us. And thank you to Farah for uh, this wonderful presentation. Um, and uh, for for sharing your work with us, truly appreciate it. And uh, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, and um, in the chat, uh, we uh, put a link to to Farah's website. Um, thank you, Katie, uh, and the store there where where you can uh, purchase her book. Okay, so um, uh, thank you all so much. Thanks for being here, and um, yeah, we'll hope you can all join us next time. Okay, thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.